by Dr. Dan Reinstein. Dan Reinstein needs no introduction. He's a consultant ophthalmic surgeon in the London Vision Clinic at UK. He's one of the pioneers in SMILE and Presbyon laser vision connection. He has a lot of publications in peer-reviewed journals. He has authored books on SMILE. Welcome, Dr. Dan Reinstein. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen here. Um, very good. Um, so are, are you able to see my slides? Yes, sir. Good, very good. Um, and, uh, and hear me properly. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I, I guess I could, I could make a lot of comments about the previous talk um, because, so is it possible to, to mute everyone else? Because I, I'm hearing uh, a lot of background noise here. Please mute all. I request all to me. There we go. That's better. Um, I mean, you know, as far as challenges, I think that uh, the challenge of presbyopia is, 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 is uh, you know, it's still a challenge, but I mean, we have presbyon now. It is an incredibly safe and effective treatment for plano presbyopes, myopes, and hypros. So I'm not sure that we're in a, we're in a challenge situation with presbyopia anymore. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about custom ablations, which I think are a little bit overrated and overused. Uh, and I'm going to try and go over why I believe that. But to answer this question, which is the question that you asked me to speak about, is biomechanical stability the reason for choosing SMILE, which is, the, which is actually the original way that Carl Zeiss um, marketed SMILE? And my answer is yes and no. And I'm going to go through this uh, talk to try and uh, um, elucidate my, my, my confusing answer. See, the, the point here is that, you know, we are told by marketing companies that PRK is better or trans-PRK is better. We're told that wavefront guided is better. Another company says topography guided is better. And another company says smile is better. And there's a company that says the fake intraocular lens is better. So we have a problem here, guys. Okay, we're, we're surgeons. We're dealing with the patient. We're trying to do the best we can for the patient. And each of the companies is giving us a very biased view of what is best for patients. And yet, if something doesn't go well, we're the ones stuck with the problem uh, to solve. So I'm going to try and go through these quickly in about 10 minutes for you. But I'll talk about the mechanics of SMILE first. Um, a few years ago, um, when this was all starting, I wrote a mathematical model uh, and published with Tim Archer and, and Brad Randleman based on Brad Randleman's original 2008 tensile strength data from uh, Cornea. Uh, <clears throat> his data was corroborated by a non-contact Brion microscopy method of, of measuring mechanics. And the, the, the front of the cornea is stronger than the back of the cornea. That's what both devices have found. And John Marshall's work um, using uh, flaps as a model uh, showed that it is not the delamination that produces the mechanical change. In fact, the strain in the cornea at 90 microns or at 160 microns is the same whether you do the delamination deep or superficial. Um, the side cut alone at 90 or at 160 microns is what makes the difference in the change in strain of the cornea. And a full flap, which is a side cut plus a delamination, is, doesn't behave differently from just the side cuts. So it's really cutting the fibers in a, hard, in a vertical fashion, that's what produces the change in strain in the cornea. So others have now experimentally also shown that, that the strain is, is maintained best with smile than LASIK, but that's kind of obvious. You, it's almost like you wouldn't have had to do this study to, to show this. It's kind of obvious that if you have more tissue that's attached, it's going to have more tensile strength. But anyway, there's a scientific study showing that SMILE was about a one and a half times stronger. And, you know, we all have heard of SMILE now, and there's a, you know, we, we run a, a, a 
16 hour course, which, which in fact starts this afternoon uh, online, um, you know, about all of the aspects of smile, the optical zone and all that. But what I want to talk about is how the mechanics make smile a superior procedure in the majority of myopic eyes. And that is because when we use our models to look at the difference between the tensile strength change, for obvious reasons, we find that the cornea is left with less tensile strength after LASIK than it is after SMILE. That's, that's clear. But, I'm, but I want to be very clear. There's nothing wrong with the tensile strength that we are leaving in the cornea of LASIK. Nothing wrong with it. So it is wrong to market SMILE as better because the tensile strength is higher. What we need to understand about it is that because the tensile strength is better, we're able to use larger optical zones, removing more tissue. So you see, we're using basically, about, we're, we're, we're taking about 30% more tissue with SMILE than we are with LASIK, but we're leaving the cornea stronger. And that relationship is what makes SMILE superior. In a six millimeter zone, the change in spherical aberration, which is what causes night vision problems, according to the amount of myopia treated, is goes, you know, obviously the, the increase in spherical aberration goes down the larger the optical zone you use, seven millimeters, 6.5, six. You see, in LASIK, using the most modern profile in a six millimeter zone, you're inducing the same pro amount of spherical aberration as a six millimeter smile, but in smile, you're actually taking less tissue. With smile in a 6.5 millimeter zone, you're taking the same amount of tissue as a six millimeter zone LASIK, but you're taking the same amount of tissue. So same amount of tissue, but less spherical aberration. And obviously in a seven millimeter zone, you're inducing way less spherical aberration and you may be taking 30% more tissue, but you're still leaving the cornea 30% stronger. So there's no drawback, if you like, in removing more tissue because the cornea is left stronger in SMILE. That's the point. At the end of the day, when you compare SMILE and LASIK in matched controls, SMILE induces 65% less spherical aberration than LASIK. And others have shown this as well. Sri Ganesh, uh, Yabo Yang, publications showing this. Now, let's talk for a second about PRK. So it amazes me that everyone's so excited about trans-PRK uh, without looking at what I have published over the last 20 years on the epithelial profile. So we know that the average profile is sort of basically a coma-like shape where it's thicker inferiorly than superior. But if you go directly to our publication, the first time you ever saw three-dimensional profiles of the epithelium uh, studied, we see that the this is 15 random eyes. You see that some eyes will have a cylindrical profile of the epithelium. So if you do a trans PRK in this, you will induce cylinder, which is not included in the refraction. Here's another eye where you will break through in the middle first and you'll induce a hyperopic shift because you're taking central tissue out before you're taking peripheral tissue out. So it makes no sense, you see. The power of the epithelium is only plano in 25% of the eyes. The power of the epithelium is outside of 0.5 diopters in 40% of eyes. So unless you're actually removing the epithelium with a knowledge of the power of the epithelium in your trans PRK procedure, you're gonna be getting outliers induced by trans PRK. Now, is it many outliers? No, it's, it's not many outliers, which is why trans PRK followers are doing it happily because, but if you were to do a proper you know, proper case control study, you would find that the trans PRK group would have some weird results that the PRK uh, uh, side would not have for this reason. And, you know, a very interesting study that I was involved in just uh, on, on, on the critical editing with, with uh, David Kang in Korea was that he compared 
wave front guided trans PRK, which is like the most modern blah, 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 with 7D tracking and everything, against SMILE, which is just a lenticule that doesn't have any customization. And we found that the efficacy was the same between the two procedures. The safety was the same between the two procedures. The accuracy was the same between the two procedures. And there was no difference in, in, in scatter. And the cylinder was corrected with the same with the two procedures. And guess what? On the aberration front, there was more spherical aberration induced in the wavefront guided treatments than in SMILE. Yes, there was slightly more coma in the SMILE group, we know that, but overall there was more higher order aberrations induced in wavefront guided trans PRK than in SMILE. Now, come on guys, that is not what you would have expected by if you were just listening to the marketing material from the companies, okay? so. You know, we're looking at evidence here, okay? Let, let's move on to, 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 to this wavefront guided concept. And I find this fascinating that 20 years later, we're still arguing about this. Look, this is 280 eyes measured with a super high resolution wavefront sensor. And this is pre-op virgin eyes. Where are the higher orders? Like there aren't any, okay? The human eye was been designed over billions of years from the tadpole to the human and we just don't have a lot of aberrations that's the way we're made we're made very well and so it seems bizarre to say that the wavefront guided part is going to improve your outcome and this is illustrated by the history of wavefront guided treatment so when physics first talked about this what they did was they basically took the spherical profiles and they put the little fairy dust of the of the wavefront on it and they thought they were going to get better results and what they found was that they got worse results the aberrations were higher uh, that's strange well what was happening was there was a ton of spherical aberration being induced by these spherical profiles and the tiny aberrations that were in one direction were just swapped for tiny aberrations in another direction and so nothing improved from a wavefront higher order standpoint so they got smart and realized that the real enemy was spherical aberration. So they increased the peripheral ablation. It's called an aspheric pro profile. Wave like called it wavefront optimized. Zeiss called it aberration smart ablation profile, ASA. And that is what made the difference. The wavefront optimization made the difference. And then, you know, if you want to put your little fairy dust on top of the aspheric profile, you can do that, but it's not going to make a big difference because virgin eyes have very little in the way of higher order aberrations. So again, circular argument. Let's go to the next one. Topography guided treatment is the best for everybody. Well, <laughs> I've had topography guided treatment available to me in the MEL 70 since I arrived in London in 2001 and then the MEL 80. Now, the reason why I never did primary topography guided treatments as a rule is because of Pablo Artal's 2001 publication in, the, in JOV, where he showed that the internal aberrations combined with the corneal aberrations lead to a total aberrations of the eye that is lower. In other words, the corneal and the internal are compensating for each other, reducing the whole eye aberrations. So you, 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 you now understand why I did not do virgin eye topography guided treatments. It made no sense. If you remove the corneal aberrations and leave the internal aberrations exposed, technically you'd be increasing the aberrations, not decreasing the aberrations. Now that's for the average eye. Of course there are exceptions. Um, and, I, and I've got to point out here that there is another big trouble with these topography guided treatments, and that's the ocular residual astigmatism problem, which is, you know, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you know that an eye that doesn't have a lot of internal astigmatism is going to be fine. But the problem comes when the corneal astigmatism is different from the refraction. In other words, the internal astigmatism is high. And if you're going to do a treatment based on reducing corneal astigmatism, the post-op corneal astigmatism is going to equal the pre-op ORA. And likewise, if you 
you know, want to leave the cornea spherical, the post-op manifest refraction is going to have the, pre the, the, the pre-op ORA. And, you know, there's software programs there to do the Alpin's vector planning and the four cities to, to, to kind of compromise between the two. But I, I just say refractive surgery is refractive surgery. So that's why it's called refractive surgery. You get a refraction here with this guy, you put it in and you treat it. Okay, so all of this compromising is just mumbo jumbo. It doesn't give you better results. Now, do I never use topography guided treatments? Well, never say never in medicine, right? I did do a topography guided treatment, but here's the thing. Mazen was talking to us about keratoconus screening. If you have an asymmetric cornea, well, you better be damn sure that that's not keratoconic. And the only way of being damn sure is to get an epithelial thickness profile showing that the epithelium is thicker where the steepening occurred. Once you've done that, you then can do a topography guided treatment and improve the patient's contrast because they had an asymmetric cornea. So this whole concept of custom treatments has got to be guarded with the fact that most eyes don't need custom treatment. So in summary, is biomechanical sobriety the reason for chewing smile? Well, Yes and no. Yes, because the biomechanical advantage leads to better optics, lower spherical aberration induction. But no, in the sense that there's nothing wrong with the fact that LASIK and PRK leave the cornea with, with slightly less mechanical tensile strength at the end of the procedure. There's nothing wrong with that. It's still sufficient. And so if you look at our practice over the last few years, we do less than 1% PRK. We do zero wavefront guided. We do 0.75% to topo guided in primary eyes. 75% of our myopic treatments are smile. And obviously some eyes are too high to be done by cornea. So they get ICLs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dan, for your wonderful presentations on biomechanical stability.